There we go. That's what we need. Okay. So we're uh, all together. Thank you very much for joining the April 20th meeting of the Vashon Mori Community Council. I'm going to just give a brief technical overview because there's always people who are kind of new to Zoom. And uh, so we just want to run through these things for our in-person meeting attendees and our Zoom meetings. So for people on Zoom, please stay muted unless you are speaking. And please sign on with either your computer or a phone, but not both. We run our meetings using the democratic rules of order. And uh, rather than Robert's rules of order, it's a much more informal and friendly way to run meetings. Now, if you wish to speak in the meeting, <clears throat> you can either raise your hand in the audience here or uh, down on the bottom of your screen, there's something called reactions. There's a reaction button and you can raise your hand. Can see I'm showing it on my screen if you can see that. And um, yes, and then when you're done, uh, once you've been called on, you can lower your hand. If you have, if you're calling in on a phone, I won't be able to see your hand raised. So you'll need to unmute yourselves with a star six and then let just call, say something, let us know you wish to speak. That's the best thing we can do for people who are calling in. And now one thing that's new for our meetings is that the chat comments and questions are not going to be tracked by me, nor are they included in the meeting minutes unless, unless they are brought to the entire meeting assembly verbally, or the uh, attendee is unable to speak. So the links and resources that are put into the chat as part of a meeting discussion or presentation will be included in the minutes. But if you do want to say something to the assembly and uh, you want to do that verbally, just think of this as being an in-person meeting for everybody, because the people here can't read your chats and I'm too busy running the meeting to read your chats. So, so that might be a little different from what you're used to, but that's how we're gonna uh, start doing it, okay? If you put something in the chat, if you wanna say something, raise your hand and join the meeting. And I, just in case anyone is having problems with, with speech or getting things across, I will, I'll just keep an eye on it. Thank you. Ben Carr, one of our board members, will keep an eye on the chat for me so I don't have to do that too. And we'll alert me if there's anything that needs to be brought to the attention of the meeting. Okay. <clears throat> now, this evening, I just want to remind everyone about our meeting decorum. So I'm just going to read this from our standing rules. The council prides itself on striving to conduct its business in a professional, respectful, and courteous manner. Common courtesy and respect for fellow islanders and guests are expected. Rudeness and bad behavior, including the chat contributions in online meetings, are not acceptable, nor will they be tolerated. This is especially so when commenting on council business or motions raised or discussed before the council members or board, and most assuredly at committee meetings. Understanding and cooperation in this regard of all meeting attendees is sincerely appreciated. Okie doke. So now we have our land acknowledgement and Jessica Anakar is uh, signing on with Zoom to read our land acknowledgement. Diane, we take a moment of silence to acknowledge and show our respect to the Coast Salish peoples. We gratefully honor Coast Salish peoples for their land stewardship and commit to continuing to build relationships. Okay, thank you very much, Jessica. Okay, now we're going to review our agenda. The agenda has been uh, sent out to people. Here we go, I've got it up on the screen and I'm going to share my screen. 
Move that out of the way. Okay. Make that bigger. All right. So we have. We have our introduction of guests, and we have John Taylor joining us tonight, Chris Bertolato. Her name was misspelled in the agenda, so you can please make a note that uh, it's Bertolato. And, uh, and Justin, would you like to uh, make a motion to ad ad add uh, Ferry Advisory Committee to the list of committee and board updates? Yes, please, for three minutes only. Okay, would someone second that motion? Second. Okay, uh, so that's one addition to the agenda. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And, aye. Okay, aye. very good. <laughs> All those opposed to this addition? Okay, the motion carries and we'll add that on to the Ferry Advisory Committee. Justin Hirsch has an update for us. We definitely wanna add that in. And we have a, on, under community updates, just so you know, if time permits, we have uh, updates from Vashon Household and Vashon Library. And those will be put in there if, if, if time permits. Okay, so there's our agenda. Are there any other changes requested to the agenda this evening? I have a question. Yes. Um, what about Captain George Drazik? Will he be attending? Yes. Yes, oh, he okay. will be. I didn't hear that, yes. sorry. Yeah, he's on the agenda. And that's now in the chat for anyone who wants their own copy. Oh, wonderful, thanks. Okay, very good. Well, then the agenda is uh, uh, approved as modified and we'll move on. So next we're going to approve the minutes of the last meeting in March. These were also sent out to our mailing list and I won't be reading them all, but I would like to uh, ask if anyone has any uh, corrections uh, to the minutes that were sent out. Hearing none, I will mark those as approved and we will continue on. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Kim, for doing those minutes in such wonderful detail. If you didn't make the meeting, you can just read those minutes. So now we our guests this evening, that I know about anyway, we have uh, John Taylor, Director of Department of Local Services. We have Chris Bertolato, Chris is the flood, uh, floodplain update community engagement coordinator for the water and land resources division of the King County Department of Natural Resources. And we also have Captain George Drazic and uh, uh, Captain Drazic, are you here with us at this point? No, but he'll be coming and he's also bringing some other people with him tonight. And uh, who else is here that uh, is a, would be considered a guest? So Alexis, would you uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and share? Yes, hi, hello everybody. My name is Alexis Manzanetis and I'm the campaign manager for Teresa Mosqueda, a Seattle city council member who is running for King County Council District 8, which of course encompasses Vashon and Murray Island. Um, she couldn't be here tonight, so I'm here on her behalf, and she just wanted to share um, her excitement to continue to make it out to the island, to meet with you all, be in community, hear um, the wants, needs, concerns, ideas um, of you all. Please don't hesitate to reach out to her or myself. She's always happy to take a phone call, to come over for coffee, um, delicious food. We love the island. So um, it's so nice to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight, Alexis. Okay, are there any other uh, guests this evening from Off Island? 
All right, very good, thank you. <clears throat> now the first uh, item on our agenda now is John Taylor. John Taylor is with us. John, I just want to show you. So one of these days you are going to- I'm going to get my asphalt. <laughs> so one of these days you are going to show up in person and I can give you Jeff's asphalt, part of his road. Jeff is here tonight, by the way. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I meant to be there tonight. Everybody, I apologize, but my partner's mom is in the hospital and I had to drive up to Bellingham. So I'm coming to you from Bellingham, Washington rather than uh, Vashon, which was my intent this evening. But so it goes. Life throws you little twists and turns. A um, couple of things I want to cover tonight, just really quickly, and then happy to field questions. Uh, Diane, you can refresh my memory. I don't think there are any outstanding issues from the last meeting that we needed to address. I think we... I don't think... I think they are. I think, I think we're covered there. So. And we actually... We also like got some graffiti removed uh, in the interim, so... All good. Uh, one good announcement. Um, every year, Department of Local Services uh, gives grants to community groups. Um, we used to call them community service area grants, uh, but Alan Painter, who is actually the architect of the community service area program, uh, passed away two years ago. And he was a lovely guy. And in the wake of that, we now call these Alan Painter grants. Uh, and so I just wanted to very quickly, we've notified the organizations, but quite a bit of grant funding went to Vashon. So we gave Mukai Farms $3,000, Voice of Vashon $1,500, Vashon Nature Center $1,000, Vashon Events $1,000, Vashon Bookmobile $1,500, Vashon Youth and Family Services $1,000. Uh, Maury Vashon Senior Center, a thousand. More uh, Vashon Maury Island Community Council, a thousand. Uh, Vashon Center for the Arts, a thousand. And the Vashon Interfaith Council to prevent homelessness, forty five hundred dollars. Um, so, all told, I'll use a quick sum function on my spreadsheet. Uh, that's about sixteen thousand five hundred dollars for community-based organizations in Vashon. Um, and that is uh, a big chunk of change relative to the entire grant program, which is about $80,000. So uh, Vashon got quite a quite a big chunk of that. So congratulations. And those are all groups we work with regularly and that is funding that will go to good use. Um, I wanted to make everyone here aware that we, over the last couple of years have been doing a lot of work with um, a group called the Unincorporated King County Economic Alliance. Uh, that was really started by three groups, um, the White Center Community Development Association, uh, the Skyway Coalition, and the um, some folks on Vashon, uh, Comunidad Vashon. And they've been doing a lot of work. They got $5 million from the county council to economic development work in unincorporated King County. And I thought it would be great if we got them out to talk to you next month, if you all have time on your agenda. Um, they're doing great work in the community. So I don't know what people think about that. You can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, but uh, they are doing a lot of good work and it would be good to make the community more broadly aware of that so that you can connect people with them, small business people, um, which is sort of their target audience. Great, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs. So I'll work with, uh, I'll work with folks and make that happen. Um, sure, go ahead. Someone had a question. Yes, like. so, uh, so yes, the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce was uh, just uh, commenting about uh, connecting with uh, the community council more. So this will be a great tie in. It'll be fabulous. Great. That's perfect. Um, and I'll just, Diane, I'll just coordinate it through you. Thank you. Um, let's see. There's lots of other stuff going on, but, uh, you know, I think the one, I, I, I'm going to make David Vogel unhappy here because uh, uh -oh. I want to talk about garbage cans for a minute. Mm -hmm. So right now they're painted and they're sitting in a yard in Renton 
I am going to be putting us in a bit of a holding pattern until the legislative session ends, because we were really hoping that the legislature this year would do the right thing after 20 years and lift this ridiculous 1% cap on property taxes for unincorporated, well, for King County. Um, folks may remember a guy named Tim Iman. Tim Iman passed an initiative 20 years ago that uh, makes it so that property taxes can't go up but more than 1% per year. Um, and that has been a big problem ever since that was done. The legislature, his case was thrown out. It was overturned by the Supreme Court. But the legislature, in a boneheaded move, in my view, I'm probably extemporizing and being a little too frank about that, uh, decided to keep it in place. And for those of you who don't work in local government, um, none of our costs go up 1% per year. Uh, and over the last two years, they've been going up per year for construction projects. They're going up 15, 20% year over year with construction inflation. Uh, so the county and a number of counties made a hard push in the legislature this year to finally get this 1% cap lifted because the being real candid, um, if it doesn't get lifted, the county is going to have some significant financial problems uh, in the next biennial budget. That's unavoidable. And uh, as of today, it's seeming like that isn't going anywhere, um, that that bill may be dead. And the consequence of that is um, we are paying for a lot of things right now with COVID dollars. The Conservation Corps, which would service those garbage cans, David, are being paid for with COVID dollars from the feds. We were looking for an increase in tax revenue to be able to continue that and since it's uncertain, I'm just putting things in a holding pattern until we know where we are. So more to come. Happy to come to next month's meeting when we know a little bit more. And I can tell you what's going on. But I just want to be very transparent with folks that that's one of the very real budget issues we're wrestling with here at King County. And I see a hand up with Paul Valent, if I got that right. Uh, yeah, it's actually Janet Valent. Um, our concern is that our appraisal our assessment goes up every year and consequently our taxes go up so it would seem to me that the county is getting more revenue we are not the roads fund does not the roads fund the way it works is we're allowed to go up one percent per year and then we get new construction so if you build a new house on Bashan or anywhere we get revenue from that new construction that's an additive. That's like new value on the on the property tax rolls, but otherwise it's capped at one percent. And in fact, uh, I know people see their assessments going up. I see my assessment going up. It doesn't actually translate into more tax revenue. The only thing that makes your property taxes go up are voter approved levies. And one of the ways that local governments have gotten around this one percent cap is by doing voter approved levies for schools. So think about all the levies you've seen on ballots over the last 20 years. Schools, a uh, lot of school levies, a lot of park levies, um, open space levies, all of that. Every time you vote for one of those, your property taxes go up, but they don't go up as a function of what we do because we can. Um, the road fund is a $100 million fund. This year, it'll be a $101 million fund yet next year. What it costs us to maintain that 1,500 miles of road and 249 bridges is not going up by 1%, I can assure you. It's going up by a lot more than that. And, you know, just being, again, super candid with folks, there is an inflection point four years out where things become very, very dire for the roads fund um, and for the entire general fund, which is all property tax based. Uh, very dire for the sheriff's office, very dire for a bunch of other programs within the county. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is mandated by the state that we have to fund, courts, jails. So 
that's where the dollars go first. And then you just have to start making hard choices. Ben Carr, you have a hand up. Uh, thanks. Uh, so who do you, is there a legislative sponsor for that bill? Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think you can you feel, free, feel free to reach out to your legislators, but this thing is drawing to a rapid conclusion and uh, there's some real significant headwinds because no one wants to take tax votes. And I get that. Um, if I was elected by people instead of hired, I, I wouldn't want to take a tax vote either. So it's easy for me to be, you know, have strong opinions about it. Um, but I don't know. I, I apologize, Ben. I don't know who the sponsor of the legislation is off the top of my head. I can easily find out and get that to you if you would like oh, to. That's fine. I can, I, can, I can look on Google. Thanks. Okay. Uh, David, your hand is up. And you're muted, David. What kind of funding is necessary for the garbage can um, uh, maintenance and, and use? Um, and could we raise a levy without being ourselves a taxing district? Uh, the county council could put a levy on a ballot and put it forth, but I think it would be it's it's very difficult to do a Vashon specific levy. Um, so okay. I think it's, you know, let's, I, I'm not saying no, and it's, it's, we're not doing it. What I am saying is before I go install a bunch of garbage cans, I want to know what's going on and what the long-term funding situation looks like, because it would be disingenuous of me to put them in and then have to terminate a program six months from now when the funding, when the federal funding that we got um, runs out. And sure. I just want to be really clear with folks about that. No, no, I, I appreciate that. And one thing, I don't know how long you're going to stay in the meeting, but we're going to just give an update on the town plan committee. And we have sent out a questionnaire, much like the questionnaire that was used to get a committee uh, for the county previously. And so far, we've had a very good turnout uh, for with some very qualified people. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. Great. Great. Well, I'm I'll, I'm happy to come back next month and give a status report on where we are. And, uh, you know, mostly good news, but a little bit of discomfitting news in there, too. Um, okay. But we'll keep working on it. All right. Thank Thus you. endeth my report. Uh, and I'm happy to field questions from anyone if folks have questions. And I'm and I'll be around all meeting if something comes up, if someone thinks of something. Uh, we have a question here. Deborah Gussin, one of our board members, has a question for you. Yeah, it's not a question. I just wanted to say thank you. I think two meetings ago, we were having a conversation about roads, and Wally followed through and put in some signals and lights to slow down traffic on the North End Curve, and so thank you. It was nice yes, to see that. You're welcome. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, tonight, uh, John, and uh, we'll see you next month. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll still time. be here. So if, oh, I see a hand up, Linda Fox. Okay. And you're muted, Linda. Thank you. Um, I was wondering with all this new housing that is being worked on and developing, does that increase more tax income for you? It, it does a little bit around the margins, but it isn't, I mean, even with the development we see, you know, the development rate in, uh, I'm just gonna have a therapeutic moment, if I may, um, so people can feel sorry for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, the there's a whole bunch of tax uh, options that are available to cities that are not available to counties. So business and occupation taxes, utility taxes, um, and, and sales taxes, the vast majority of sales tax activity takes place in the cities. That was the design of the Growth Management Act. Um, so the whole intent of the Growth Management Act is to not have a lot of development in unincorporated King County and have it concentrated in the urban incorporated area. Uh, and, you know, that's why, and, and I will just say, um, as a pretty, not avid, but, you know, a regular fly fisher person, 
it's pretty awesome that I can get in a car and drive 45 miles out to the middle fork of the Snoqualmie River and be trout fishing um, in a dense urban environment. There just aren't a lot of places in America where you can do that. Go out to the Snoqualmie Valley sometime and drive around and see, you know, a huge number of viable commercial farms that are still in business that are 25 miles from, you know, the county courthouse. Uh, that isn't a circumstance that exists in a lot of urban places. So the Growth Management Act has delivered all of its intent in King County in a really significant way. And it's what makes this a great place to live. The flip side of that is, and the trade-off that was made is there's not a lot of economic activity in unincorporated King County. There are 250,000 people outside of that urban growth boundary. And, um, including some of the urban inholdings that haven't been annexed yet. And the vast majority of commerce goes on on the other side of the line. The people who live in the Snoqualmie Valley don't shop in unincorporated King County. They drive to Duval and Carnation and Redmond and, you know, further to go buy flat screen TVs and dishwashers. And so we don't get any of that revenue. Um, we do get some added construction revenue, but it's, de minimis compared to what goes on in the city of Seattle. Um, you know, the city of Seattle, when uh, we had, when we hit the big recession in 2008, their, their sales tax went off a cliff because they'd gotten addicted to the construction sales tax from all the steel and all the concrete and all the windows and everything else that was bought to build all those buildings. 10% um, of that is tens and tens of millions of dollars. And it just went away overnight. So like we we get a little bit around the margins, but it's it's rounding errors compared to the big jurisdictions, unfortunately. Hello? Yes. So could you um, come, come on up here so make sure, sure they can hear you? Yeah. Have your name off for so my name is Mike Doss. Can you see me? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Great. Hi. Um I this is really kind of uh poking some sticks in my opinion about, um, uh, you know, when, when you get into our taxation system, all you're telling us is you want to raise the property taxes. One of the most regressive taxes in the United States of America. And so those of us who are not rich, who are stuck with our taxation system, would be would bear the burden of that, including a lot of people that who are older and cannot afford these increases in property taxes. So uh, I understand you getting up here in front of this body and making a plea that the county needs more money. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, and for you to make your case about why that is in the public's best interest. But telling us how we're going to fund you, I think is inappropriate. I, I, my Mike, I'm not, a, I'm not pleading for anything. I'm just telling you the reality. And I agree with you that the property tax is a regressive tax. So is the sales tax. Uh, in fact, the sales tax is a significantly more regressive tax, and that's the backbone of every budget in every city in King County. Um, I, you know, I'm not I, like I'm I'm a policy implementer and to some degree a policy maker, but there's a conversation that's to be had in the legislature about a more progressive tax system that's been a long time coming. All I'm telling you is in the absence of action by the legislature, uh, you can expect less out of our road network in the next 10 years. That's basically my, my bottom line message. And my message to David was, uh, I'm in a bit of a holding pattern. I'm putting garbage cans out until I know what that looks like. So. Okay. It would be nice if you could actually give us that, that how much it would cost to maintain the system because there are lots of resources here in the island and we might find another source for funding to do that if it's important. Well, uh, Mike, there are a number of studies that have been done over the years on what it would cost to 
optimize the road network in unincorporated King County. And depending on which one you believe, the number is somewhere between 300 and $450 million a year. Uh, our annual, our annual okay. budget, uh, Mike, let me just finish my thought, buddy. Uh, our annual budget is $100 million. So we're underfunded by a significant amount as it is. If, if you have $150 million in your sofa cushions, you let me know. I don't think anyone- All, I'm, talk all I'm talking about is this trash can project. Can you please tell us how much it would cost to fund having the trash can that's being That's it. Oh, uh, I can't off the top of my head. It's a crew of four that we run on a weekly basis. And I, I don't know exactly what that cost is. Um, but it's, you know, probably, well, I'm not going to, I'd be guessing. It's in the tens to hundred thousands of dollars a year to run it. Okay. If, if you could find out for us, that would be yep, very helpful. Happy to, I'll bring it to your next meeting. Okay. We need to move on now. No more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a difficult situation. It A different way of providing, getting taxes would be a good, a good thing down the road. Yep. All right. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you next month. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Next, we have Chris Bertolato to give us an update. Hi, everyone. I just want to make sure first that you can hear me. Can you hear me? And yes. can, you can see me. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I do have a presentation. Um, and and I, I need permission to do that. And I'll give that to you. Thank you. <laughs> There we go. All right. So let me um, do one other thing. And I am just trying to find you all again. There you are. Um, can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay, okay now we can. Okay, great. Let's see if I can make these go away. Uh, oops. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if that bar will go away eventually, so hopefully it does. Uh, my name is Chris Bertolato, and I work in King County uh, in the River and Floodplain Management section. And I want to thank you for giving me some time on your agenda to talk about flooding and um, the flood management plan update process, which um, has direct impacts on, on everyone that lives in King County. So, um, my main intent is to provide a very short presentation and hopefully allow time for questions and discussion. And I am going to give a very uh, quick overview of flooding risks in King County. And I'm, I've shifted the presentation to really focus on what's unique about Bashan Mori Island. So I won't be talking about Snoqualmie or Carnation very much. I'll, I'll try and talk about Bashan. Um, and I'm going to go through these other items. So, um, and I, right now I can't really see hands up. And, and so if I, maybe Ben, if you wanna call me out, if there's something that's coming up, you think I need to pause, then please let me know. I can't see all of you anymore. Um, so first, it, it's a pretty obvious statement to say that floods have impact because they certainly do. And I wanna acknowledge that some of you might know this in a very personal way. Some of you may have experienced flooding in the past. And, you know, I'm not trying to say that all everyone's experiences are the same because they are absolutely unique. Um, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the negative impacts of flooding, because when you have floodwaters coming into your home or up covering the road that you want to cross, that, that all you're thinking are negative thoughts. However, there are some um, positive impacts of flooding that I want to share with you because it's a part of uh, the King County landscape. Flooding has been here for um, generations, it will continue to be here. We don't expect flooding to ever truly go away. Um, some of the positive impacts of flooding are that it creates fish and wildlife habitat. It can also recharge aquifers, which can be quite important in some communities. And in other communities, um, the creation of rich agricultural soils is a big part of flooding. So it's a natural part of the landscape. It is also the most common natural hazard that we have in King County. It's, we do believe that flooding will become uh, 
more frequent and more severe with climate change. And I believe that you're already all seeing that. I've talked to um, a colleague, Greg Rayborn, who shared some of the experiences you've had recently. And you know, it's very clear that you're probably seeing water get further inland or uh, stick around longer than it has been before. Um, and even if you don't live right on a water body, there's a potential that in the future there, there could be flooding or flood impacts. Since 1990, we've had um, 13 presidentially de declared disasters due to flooding, and that's an average of one flood every two and a half years, which is a pretty stunning number. And, you know, beyond that, there have been dozens of smaller floods that happen. So again, flooding is this natural process. We think climate change is going to be changing what that looks like on our landscape. Um, and there are some impacts that come with that, and there are risks. We um, we have a lot of people that live and work in uh, flood-prone areas, and these are images from around King County. And um, right now, we we believe there are about fifty-seven thousand people that live in these high-risk flood-prone areas. That's probably a low number. Um, there are sixty-five thousand jobs that are located within the flood-prone areas. So if you think of places like the Kent Valley. Um, that's a really great example of a, a thriving uh, economic hotspot that uh, generates um, in the county $3.7 billion uh, annually. And um, we have lots of infrastructure scattered across the landscape. Um, things like roads that are very obvious when you have a, a road washout um, that is a direct impact, but also there are underground utilities or above ground utilities that support a quality of life that we've all become accustomed to. So floods cause uh, damage to property and infrastructure, as you can see in these images. And um, that these impacts extend not just to homeowners, but also to renters and to people that are unhoused. Um, the, it can, uh, flooding can damage or shut down businesses and schools. Uh, it can wash out roads and bridges, which really can cut off access. Even if you live, like I do, fairly far inland, and don't expect to experience flooding in the future, some of the places I go may not be accessible to me. Um, and then, you know, the utilities I was talking about are things like electricity, sewage, uh, septic lines, community septic lines, cable, water. Like if those are disrupted, we we all feel that. So um, when the when the waters recede, um, I don't know what that is, so I'm gonna just do that. When waters recede, there are impacts. Um, that we still have to address. So it's not just when a flood happens. Those can be damages that need to be uh, repaired and also the flood protection facilities that we might have throughout the county. And um, that, that leaves kind of a, a workload for us. So there, um, let's see if I can just figure out how to move that. Oh, I can. I'm going to move that there. How lovely. So the landscape changes. And this picture um, from KVI is really just a great image of this. Um, so each King County community is very different in how water moves across the landscape, as well as how the landscape itself forms. And um, the water movement is dynamic, it changes, and um, the land processes, like the, the formation of a spit or the erosion of a, a high bluff, um, is you know is also something that is like the landscape is naturally changing. And um, these are natural processes. So when the, the, the sources of flooding can be from uh, coastal flooding, if you have a king tide and a, a certain type of storm, you can see a greater uh, push of water inland. Sea level rise is, always, is only going to make that worse over time. And low-lying areas can also become flooded uh, when kind of our natural and also man-made systems are overwhelmed. So if you heard about the flooding that happened in South Seattle in the South Park area, that was the combination of all kinds of systems combusting and not working for a whole community of people. And um, when rivers flood, and I understand uh, Vashon Moria doesn't have a large river system, but you have some creeks nearby. Um, so when those uh, rivers are overwhelmed, um, with precipitation or snowmelt or whatever it might be, um, water can flow over the banks and get into what's on the other side. And another change here um, is that um, our uses change and they've changed significantly. So some of you have probably lived on Bashan Mori for many, many years and have seen lots of changes take place. And 
when we when we really start having problems around flooding is when you have increasing numbers of people living in very these natural flood risk areas so um, or flood hazard areas so risk increases as more and more people move into places that perhaps uh, folks had not lived in before and this really brings us to the flood plan so the flood plan is this roadmap that allows us to thread the needle between the natural hazards on the landscape and how those hazards might change over time and the, the risks that are created when humans are also in that landscape. It's a conflict between what someone might want to have happen on their property and what a water body uh, winds up doing. So the flood plan allows us to navigate that the um, kind of complexities and the risks to public safety this isn't just about uh, property it's also about human health and safety infrastructure and property and the plan itself includes um, the problem areas that we have it describes things that we can do to help with flooding in these problem areas it also talks about how we as a community and as individuals can be more prepared and how we as a local government can help others be more prepared and resilient in the face of flooding and it defines policies that guide county decision making about what should and shouldn't happen in areas that experience flooding. And the flood plan is very focused um, and has regulatory impact in unincorporated King County. Local municipalities, cities do not need to adopt this flood plan. It does not necessarily apply to incorporated areas. Um, and many jurisdictions adopt elements and have adopted elements of past plans. So this is not our first plan. This is gonna be a pretty significant, I think, uh, rewrite. We had a new flood plan in 2006 that created the King County Flood Control District. Um, and there was a property talking about taxes. There's a fee on your property tax that pays into the flood control district. Um, and then in 2013, that was updated. And it, what I want to point out is how that the plan that we're working under right now is very focused on flood risk reduction. Uh, in terms of reducing the risks of flooding, avoiding or minimizing the harm when we do those actions, whatever they might be, and to reduce long-term costs. It had a very narrow focus. Um, I just I do want to say that in 2006 and 2013, the King County Flood Control District, who my um, section, the River and Floodplain Management section, often asks, acts as a service provider to, did adopt these plans as their guiding documents. And it's our hope that they'll do that as well, even though these are King County plans. So one of the results of that, the past 20 years of floodplain management is we have really focused on major river flooding. Um, and I'm talking specifically about the river and floodplain management section. There are other parts of King County that uh, work more on stormwater uh, flooding. However, there are some areas that are missing from this map. If you think about um, the Saman Lake Sammamish and the areas um, north of Lake Sammamish into Lake Washington, the Sammamish River, but also Vashon Maury Island um, really have not gotten much attention in the current way that the flood plan has been interpreted. And I'm not talking about other departments, I'm really talking about um, flood risk reduction efforts related to the flood plan itself. So there's there are definitely um, gaps geographically and service. And that I think raises some has raised some questions about how we can make sure that there's equity in um, the work and the benefits that come out of flood, the implementation of the flood plan. There's a whole toolbox full of um, ways that we can apply to different types of problems. And one of the questions, the only question um, I heard before I came was what's going on with the flooding at Chautauqua Beach? And I'll, I'll say right now, I'm not an expert, and I did, again, talk to Greg and get a little bit of a lowdown, but I thought I'd use that example as what, you know, the different tools that we can pull out. The one big part of how we manage flood risk is, for anyone is understanding where those hazard areas are and how severe they can be. And, you know, um, mapping and, and ha um, doing quite a bit of work. And I think my understanding is with Ch Chautauqua Beach, um, there has been a, a many years of King County uh, research and, and review and attempts to address what are um, seem to be frequent or um, increasing amounts of flooding along that area, um, uh, preventing some road access. And um, 
that's one tool that we have is really trying to understand the problem. I'm going to go in different order. The other is protecting public infrastructure. And it can be that we have facilities or do different types of capital projects. And the King County Roads Department has um, taken the lead role of trying to create um, a solution uh, or a series of solutions to the challenge there, but also is now actively looking for grant funds to pay for a project in that area. They recently put in a grant request, which was declined. So I know that there's, um, I know that there's ongoing interest and effort to figure out how to make some improvements within the context of that site and the culvert and perhaps contaminated soils nearby and not wanting those to escape. Um, so those are like two of the tools that can be used. Another is really looking at um, development regulations and collaborating with others to make sure that we are limiting development in areas that are hazardous so we don't create new risk working with individuals so that they can be more prepared and protected against flooding. There's a whole bunch of different ways that we do that. And we also manage the flood warning system. And that uh, right now the flood warning system is very focused on large rivers. So if you live in a large river valley, you can go to the flood warning center or, or get the flood alerts uh, about um, incoming or uh, upcoming flood events. If anyone's interested in knowing more about Chautauqua, I'm happy to take names and get people in touch with someone who is way more informed about what is going on at that site than I am. I just wanted to at least address the question. Um, so, you know, the flood plan itself, you know, does um, include an, er an element of preparedness and emergency response. And there are a lot of things that people can do um, that are free or low cost. And um, all of them right now are on this kingcounty.gov prepare for flooding website, which I encourage people to check out. There are also more expensive things people can do, but this is, I think, what most of us can do um, to, to be more prepared um, as a community and as individuals. So the, we have talked to, we, uh, I'll give you this, the schedule in just a minute. Um, we've talked to quite a few folks and have started hearing what, what is important to include in the next flood plan. And these, um, I'll put three up right away. These really do align with where uh, King County started thinking that there are some major gaps that we need to address. There is this geography, the, the geographic gaps of coastal areas not really being included in the current flood plan, but there's also that very tight focus on flood risk reduction. There's an image here of a project in the Snoqualmie River um, where uh, there was a, um, an area that was eroding. It was very close to the water pipeline that feeds the city of Seattle and many other communities. Um, the freshwater pipeline. There were nearby farms that were being uh, flooded because of um, undersized culverts or culverts that weren't working. Um, there's really um, some need for improvement for fish and wildlife habitat, as well as improving the stream health in this area. So these types of multi-benefit projects where we're doing flood risk reduction, but also meeting other community needs have been the exception rather than the norm. And I think there's an interest that we're hearing to make sure that and you can think about it as the most efficient use of um, dollars, uh, public dollars, is that we are looking at um, doing more than just flood risk reduction. We're trying to understand what community needs are and meeting those at the same time. The other piece of this is that the current plan, the 2013 plan, does not um, have really any mention of climate change in it. And that's a huge gap. Um, and so climate change adaptation and resilience is an important component of where we think the next plan will go. I talked about um, equity and kind of this geographic distribution. King County um, staff that have been working on this and, and the King County leadership have acknowledged that past plans have not been informed by the full diversity um, of people who live and, and work and love King County. And so we're working quite hard to make sure that the next plan is informed by perspectives of people who are um, truly at risk and, and, and most vulnerable to flooding. And um, so far, as I said, public feedback has kind of echoed these themes, but we know there are many other things that we're hearing from the community, and we know that this is not an inclusive list. And so the reason I'm here today is really to encourage people to provide public comments into this 
update process. And I'll talk more about how to do that. So another um, piece that's moving is a kind of a new concept for us is, is building flood resilience. Um, in the past, we've and currently we focus very much on reducing risk, but resilience is different. It's the ability for people to recover quickly and completely from flooding. And depending on what resources you have uh, available to you, what kind of safety net you have, different people will be less or more able to recover from a flooding event. And it, it is, has really nothing to do with how good of a person they are, but more about their situation um, and their experience in society. So building flood resilience is something that I think we'll see more of in the flood plan, especially if that is what we continue to hear from the community that's important. So, so you know, and if any of these ideas are like, no, you think that's a bad idea, then we still need to hear from you because we wanna be informed by your point of view. So I'm not gonna go over these individual boxes, but I, I think what I wanna kind of step away from with this idea of resilience is that it starts by making sure that the perspectives of people who are most impacted by flooding, um, or could be, are, um, are, are heard in this process. The flood plan schedule, just so you have a sense of timing, is we've, we've been at this for a little while, um, and we have been doing some pre-planning, which involved quite a bit of research about how to bring equity into floodplain management, into managing these flood hazard areas. Uh, we've been working and talking to tribes, we're now currently in the phase of active community and partner engagement, as well as drafting a plan. Um, we intend to have a draft for to, that will be sent to the King County Council. And that draft should be prepared in November or so of 2023, so not very far out, as well as the, the a plan, a draft, that draft plan going to the King County Council, who will ultimately be the ones to decide what goes into the plan. Um, and hopefully in 2024, we do have a new updated plan that is uh, improved from our current, our current options. So in the community engagement side, which is, as I said, is where I really focus, we're in the stage right now of still writing and building the shared vision and goals for the plan. And so we're asking people, like, what are your experiences of flooding? And what, you know, if we're thinking about multi-benefits, what, are, what is important to you in your community so that we can really be informed by, by your thoughts? And we're asking folks also, what do you need to be prepared? We want to hear from you about what you need from us rather than us pretend that we know what you need, uh, which would probably wind up being wrong. We also will have another phase in a few months where we have emerging strategies and priorities emerge and asking people to reflect on those and give us their feedback and maybe specific ideas. So really kind of drilling down into the nitty gritty of what is it that you need? Uh, and that can be places where specific, that can be a point when specific um, places are mentioned or ideas are mentioned. And um, the plan that we have right now does include project lists as well. And um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the funds are immediately there, but it does give it a higher priority if it is in the plan. And then there'll be an opportunity for folks to comment on that draft plan in November-ish. So um, I'm almost done and I appreciate your patience as I go through all this. Um, I, um, I come from a long and colorful history of community engagement and my sense is that people, um, people are always, you know, no one, there's no one way that works for everyone to be informed and to, to feel like they can engage. And so um, we have heard loud, loudly from the community that King County, especially our section, the river and floodplain management section has just simply not been talking to people about flooding enough. So we're coming to meetings, we're coming to local events. Um, we are also working with community partners who have the ear and the trust of some of those folks who are most vulnerable um, and we really don't have relationships with. And so we are funding them we're co-creating strategies that work for them. And uh, we do plan to host some county sponsored meetings uh, virtually and in person. And we have an online uh, survey. It's, um, it's in multiple languages. This is the link to the, to the English one. And we're also just willing to kind of um, be called or have, be sent an email. All of the comments that we're getting in these meetings or uh, afterwards or in different settings or at events, we're capturing um, as part of our record. And all that information is being brought to the um, partner planning committee, who is a kind of state, like a stakeholder group of a, a lot of different interests, community peoples, 
agencies who are helping to shape the plan so it's not just created by King County staff. So um, our contact info is here. If you have questions about Bashan or Maury Island that I, you know, um, that are kind of beyond the scope, I encourage you to reach out to Greg, who's uh, one of your neighbors and the local basin steward. And then the QR code is to bring you right to that survey if you wanted to um, take 10 minutes or so and fill in your thoughts. So with that, um, I think what I can do is maybe um, stop sharing and see if there's time for any questions. It, does that sound right, Diane? Yeah, we won't have time for questions this evening. I'm sorry. We're, okay. We have a lot to cover tonight. Okay. Thank you for that. But we have, uh, thank you very much. It was very thorough and we have your information and it's going to be uh, on the website and uh, uh, really appreciate your coming. We have a lot to go through this evening and we're on time. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, next we have Captain George Drezich and I know he's joined the meeting and, uh, and he's going to first cover the issue of human trafficking. Captain Drezich? Hi there, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, fantastic. I'm coming to you from my car, so I don't have the best lighting, but we'll do what we can here. So uh, it's very uh, great of you to include us. We're happy to be here. I've asked uh, to join with me today, uh, Sergeant DeVore, who's on the meeting, and Detective Grotsky, who's with him. Um, I just uh, very quickly, by way of introduction here, I am the captain for uh, precinct four of the King County Sheriff's Office, which includes Vashon Island. So um, beneath me are the sergeants and, and beneath them are the detectives and deputies. So I have uh, supervision uh, over all of that. In this particular instance, uh, I was not physically there. It's not common for captains to be there, but I was aware of it. And so the reason I've asked Sergeant DeVore and uh, Detective Grotsky to join us today is they were uh, involved and they know answers to questions that I don't. So they are the experts on this topic. So uh, they are on now and I'll let them introduce themselves and take it from here. Hello, I'm uh, Chad DeVore. I'm a, I'm a sergeant with the Sheriff's Office. I supervise the criminal intelligence unit at a headquarters. Um, and I have several detectives that work for me that have different uh, uh, expertises, uh, one of which is uh, human trafficking and vice uh, related uh, um, issues, both in, on the labor side and on the uh, um, uh, sexual side. Um, so yeah, happy to answer questions about that. As it relates to the investigation um, that you're referring to, Captain, that was a, that, that's a joint investigation with Homeland Security um, that's ongoing. So it's going to be hard to get into details about that. Uh, we can answer general questions about issues that we're seeing over on the island uh, and over here in the, the main area of the county. Um, but it would be very tough for us at this point to get into details about that specific investigation. Okay, and that being the case, um, I'm, we're happy to open it up to uh, any questions that all of you folks may have. And then uh, Sergeant DeVore can uh, answer those if he's you know, able to per the parameters of the investigation or else uh, respectfully tell you that he can't uh, in the interest of the investigation itself. So, so uh, anybody that would like to feel free to uh, send your questions out to him and, and we'll address those now if we can. So we have someone with her hand up. Jessica Anakar has her hand up with a question. Can you tell us how many victims were taken in the raid and will you sign their URT applications and are they still detained? Uh, the victims were never detained um, uh, per se. The suspects in the case, this was a, la a labor trafficking uh, investigation. Um, that was that's uh, still very ongoing. Um, so yeah, the victims were not detained. They were provided uh, opportunities for resources. Um, the UT visas or continued presence uh, type visas, uh, those questions would have to be directed over to Homeland Security for those. Um, I will say generally, um, we don't uh, like to leave anybody, especially victims, uh, without any resources. And so in order to, for us to provide them resources, we do have to pursue one of those avenues. So uh, to that extent, yes, those are being um, uh, pursued if, if needed. But again, I just wanna be clear, um, the, 
the the victims or the rescuees of this investigation were not detained in any fashion. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? People can raise your hand. Oh, Jean, Jean Berlsheimer has a question. It's Berlsheimer. I know it's a hard name. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, I'm just wondering how it's decided what kind of um, force or um, what's needed in a situation like that. It just seems like uh, I, I was not present, but reading the stories in the beachcomber and um that the you know helicopters and i don't know if they were officially called squad cars but it just seems like so traumatic especially when there were children involved so i'm just wondering how how is a decision made about what is needed to um to jump into a situation like that so on, on this particular incident, the uh, the tactical decisions were made by the Homeland Security uh, Investigations Division of uh, here in Seattle. So I'd have to refer for specific things on that case to them. Um, the tactical operation stuff was not planned or, or carried out to the fullest extent by the sheriff's office. Now, I will say generally in these uh, type of investigations, uh, we're dealing with predators, right? The ones that are involved in trafficking um, they're attempting at all odds to um, conceal themselves from accountability from law enforcement or from being held account accountable. So there is a there is a threat side to that that I think the general public doesn't necessarily see. And I think us as an agency at times may not convey very well. So uh, depending on the scale of the investigation, and I'm talking generally here, but depending on the scale of the investigation that we're doing, um, we will, we would have to have enough personnel to support that. Right. So if you went into a situation in which you had, let's say five victims and we had four traffickers, um, that that's nine people total, but the amount of, um, uh, work that is required, uh, to, 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 to get those victims, the, the resources they need to get them generally relocated to a safe environment and get them get them uh, aid and, and, and resources, in some cases, translators, just so that they feel comfortable and, and, and can th start to thrive again is significant. Um, and then on the, on the suspect side, um, uh, these were federal, uh, these were uh, federal crimes and state crimes, but those are two different complete tracks, right? So uh, there's a lot of work and paperwork that goes in it for the detectives that are investigating those to make sure that they're meet, they, have, they have certain deadlines and criteria they have to meet. Um, to get the, the the perpetrators held accountable um, for that for that for the immediate future, so it is significant um, to that. Our, we do deploy a helicopter. Uh, the sheriff's department does, and so that helicopter um, can generally be used uh, if we're having a, a large investigations. It has a camera equipped on it, and so that camera is able to capture what's happening from a large uh, from a thousand feet, if you will. And then feed that back to a command post for people that are making decisions on where to push uh, resources to. Uh, as you're all aware, um, uh, usually if if uh, we're going into a situation where we're going to have limited resources or we're going to be confined, i.e. an island, uh, we generally like to bring as much resources as we can that we are anticipating to be used. Um, but again, um, this was a Homeland Security investigation, which the Sheriff's Office assisted with, but we did not do all the tactical planning for it. So I'd feel odd to answer questions for Homeland okay. Security. Okay, I, I guess I just wanted to to um, add that, I mean, clearly it's very complicated, but some of us, myself particularly, and people <laughs> I know, are concerned that these are members of our community and the whole uh, Latinx community has been impacted by this. And so just want to put that out there that it's this is uh, has just rippling effect. And these are people who've lived here for many, many years. So are you referring to the suspects or the victims? Yeah, the suspects. Yeah. I understand. I want to respect their uh, rights too. They haven't been proven uh, guilty in a court of law yeah. yet for for the things that we're accusing them of, or that law enforcement is accusing them of. Um, however, after reviewing several parts of that investigation, I, there is significant significant evidence there. So, 
I understand that. And I, I respect that. We also have a duty to the victims, um, even if they don't reside here, um, uh, to, to hold them uh, in, the, in the palm of our hands as much as we can as well. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'd like, to Thank jump you. In, I'd like to jump in real quick and, and offer the opportunity to anybody uh, that's interested uh, to address any rumors, you know, rumor control, things you might have heard. Um, if there's anything we can address along those lines, you know, we'd be happy to sometimes, you know, how the telephone game goes and, and uh, we'd love to address any maybe things you've heard if you've got any concerns. We have a question here in the, at the Lantris building. Would you come on up, please? So they can all hear you and see you. Okay. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, it, this is a big surprise to everybody that this happened. And I'm wondering if, um, you know, Vashon Island is a place where it's quiet and there's not much law enforcement. Do you suspect or predict that this might be a problem going forward with other people? Or And could you state your name, please? Oh, I'm Selena Yarkin. Thank you, Sam. Um, so in King County as a whole, um, we are, uh, we have a high incidences of both labor and sex trafficking, like we discussed earlier. Um, there's several reasons for that. We are a seaport uh, county. Uh, we also share bo uh, international border. And um, so for that, we do get, uh, we do get a high influx of victims coming into, um, into our area. Uh, the ruleness, I, I I would say the majority of the cases that we're uh, involved in are not obviously not on Vashon or on the island at all. Um, but that being said, uh, the predators and the suspects that are involved in these cases, they 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 seek out um, the rural areas because of anonymity and the ability to kind of, um, you know, be on large pieces of property to try to avoid detection. So I, that is an issue that we deal with on, as a on the county as a whole. Um, but I, I, I would not, I would, I'll let Alex speak to some of it too, but I, I would not uh, suggest that, that Vashon is the, uh, in any way, shape or form the central hub for us uh, for these types of crimes. Yeah, we, we don't see uh, very much uh, going on on Vashon as a whole. Uh, the majority of it's over on the, on the mainland King County area or Seattle area there. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Michelle Garrett has a question. Yes, thanks. Um, following up in the spirit of the questions that are particularly about concern for the victims uh, and for other neighbors on the island who might also be vulnerable to trafficking, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to ask the three of you if any of you have advice on how neighbors can kind of weave a community of care around these issues um, without invading anyone's privacy, of course, but how can we be aware? Um, how can we practice mutual care and concern? How can we, as consumers um, in industries where we know people are vulnerable to trafficking, landscaping, um, hospitality, house cleaning, we know those are industries where people are vulnerable. So um, both as neighbors and consumers, is there anything in your view that we can do to help safeguard our friends and neighbors? Uh, yes, um, uh, you, you live in a very uh, tight knit community um, for the most part over there. It's a very safe uh, community. And you, because of living there, um, have a sense of, of what what is what is the norm and and what is kind of um, I'm trying to find the words like what's out of place yeah what's out of place what, what's an odd thing that's going on so you you would detect probably before most law enforcement that's not familiar with your area if there's something to miss and so being being the eyes and the ears of that can really help specifically with these victims now I have to say that human trafficking. Um, and what we see in, in, in videos and in, in, in the news and in the, in the uh, uh, movies is not what we experience here um, as far as, 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 as how it is portrayed out, right? 
the the movies like to to portray human trafficking as somebody being kidnapped from a foreign land thrown in a box and brought over here against their will and pushed out now that doesn't happen so i don't want to disclaim it totally but the large the large majority of this is more of somebody being enticed to come over here um or come into an area in which they're they may not know the customs they don't know the traditions they have no network of support uh, they're totally reliant on the person that brought them here. They're usually brought here under false pretenses. And then once they have arrived here, um, then, then, then they're given the burden of either some kind of debt or working for minimal amount of money that they can't survive on their own for. And now, they're, now they're, 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 they have to entrust their lives into the traffickers, right? So you get a Stockholm effect that, that, that is ongoing. That is what we're seeing as a, as a whole here in the state specifically in King County. And King County is kind of a hub for it because a lot of this, a lot of this crime starts out internet-based. And we have a lot of the hub here for that. So um, you seeing somebody that looks like they're, they're, they're down and out, that they're not fitting into a community or they do their best to avoid any kind of community interaction is, is probably the first thing that's going to be alerted to you, right? So as a law enforcement officer, I would like you know, the, that to be reported, because that really helps us um, be able to track uh, uh, the people that are that are committing these crimes and, and, and to go after them. Now, it brings up a, another side is normally when we encounter these victims, both on the labor and the sex side, they're uh, specifically if they're foreign nationals, um, they're not necessarily very cooperative with law enforcement or i.e. the government, right? Because they they they've been they've been trained to fear them they've been trained to stay away from them because of corruption that's happening in other parts of the world and stuff so it it takes a while for us to build up that same level of rapport that the trafficker has with the victim in order for us to start providing resources and, and I was talking to some whoever was talking earlier about the UT visas and the continued presence uh, laws that we have that's very beneficial for us uh, to get there. But it, this is in no way a quick resolution crime. Um, you know, Detective grotsky has got a full plate. We have one main human trafficking detective on the department. So he's responsible for the whole county and his caseload is through the roof. Um, and, and these cases take sometimes years um, to get adjudicated and to get that victim in a place uh, where they can start to thrive again and, and live life. Okay, we have uh, three minutes left on this part of this uh, uh, discussion. So we, we'll just take these last two questions and please be uh, succinct and brief. Melvin Mackey. Yes, thank you very much for being here and talking to us. Uh, I'm really trying to get my head around the scope of this, this issue. And I'm hearing things mentioned as people uh, in plural and, and singular. I, I was under the impression that it was one person but if you're talking about more than one, so Mike, I have two two questions. How many people have been charged with something related to trafficking, and how many people have been charged in relation to sexual abuse? You, are you talking generally speaking, sir? Or are you talking about this? I'm talking about this one incident on 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 Bash on Maury Island. Uh, I can't talk to the specific charges yet. Um, that, that would be out of place for us to be able to do right now. I will say that um, in um, the majority of trafficking cases that we're doing, it, it's multiple people. It takes a conspiracy in, in order to, for these to flourish. So it, it would be rare for us to just charge one person or have uh, one person that's responsible for the act. Thank you. Okay. And our last question, Eve, would you uh, share? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what, similar to Michelle's question about um, wanting to support people who might be victims of trafficking, kind of a similar question. I, I, it, um, as Jean mentioned, that the, the whole community has been traumatized by both the trafficking, but also the law enforcement response, and people are afraid now. And so I'm wondering what is it that we can do in advance of a law enforcement action to prevent the kind of trauma and fallout 
that the rest of the community experiences in situations like this? That's kind of a tough question because these, these are very complex cases where a lot of times it seems like when people start to notice things, it's been going on for a long time. Um, so to say there's there's an easy answer up front, um, it's the easiest thing to say is the airport motto, you know, see something, say something. Um, a lot of times if you can tip us off early, we can get involved early. Uh, but as far as a, a community, um, a lot of times these things have been going on for, for some time before anyone really notices. Okay, thank you all very much for this information on this and the discussion and the questions. We're now going to turn back to Captain Drezich for the next part of this, his presentation. And uh, um, Sergeant DeVore and Detective Grotsky uh, will likely jump off at this point. I brought them in and thank you guys for uh, answering those questions. Uh, so the next part of this, uh, the next little segment of time here I have is to address this uh, rehabilitation facility. Um, and Diane, would you like uh, to brief the group a little bit on this on uh, the facts or basis uh, of the things we've discussed to bring everyone up to speed? Or uh, do you think that'd be appropriate now? Uh, I think uh, most everybody here tonight is pretty much up to speed on, on where the community is at. And uh, I expect if you haven't yet read the Beachcomber articles, but you, you should. <laughs> and uh, so the basic uh, question is, uh, what can we do as a community to assure safety and human respect when the drug treatment center opens up down the road? Yes, Those and are I can, basically I can, the questions I've been getting from the sure, community. Sure, and I understand uh, the community's concern for sure. And for those uh, who didn't see me uh, the last time I was on the meeting, let me quickly say that um, my history with the sheriff's office includes working in Vashon Island uh, as a deputy. Uh, for, you know, in years past, driving all the roads, answering the calls, being there day and night. Um, and I personally have, you know, a love for the community. I, you guys are very blessed and fortunate to live in such a great place. And I love visiting there and, and working there. Um, it's, it's always a treat for me. Uh, years later, as a sergeant, when I promoted to sergeant, I supervised uh, the cops that work out there. Um, and now, years later, uh, I'm a newly promoted captain just of a few months ago. And so uh, I'm back once again and very grateful to be here in another capacity. So... Uh, I do have some history and definitely fondness in my heart for the island and, and for all of you. Um, so I understand that an, an issue like this can be unsettling. It's the unknown, right? Um, there are things that we're not sure of, and you've got a wonderful place. And of course, we all want to keep it that way. And so I'm happy to address any concerns you may have. I can tell you up front that uh, we as a sheriff's office have no reason to believe that there uh, is any expectation of increased crime or safety concerns. I personally don't have any uh, history or experience with this particular organization, but in preparation for this meeting, I reached out to one of our detective sergeants in our precinct uh, and asked him to do a little research for me. Um, and he told me that he doesn't, in his research, he doesn't find any same thing, any reason for an expectation of an increase of crime. Um, of course, no one can predict the future, but we can look at um, past practice as a potential indicator. And with facilities like this, we don't see um, any red flags or causes for alarm. That's very encouraging. I really appreciate hearing that. And uh, we have some questions now. And first we have Linda Moore as a question. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I wanna clarify you're saying that we the community has concerns. I think that that might be some people in the community have concerns. There are a lot of people that are coming forward to support what's going to happen there. Um, right. Vashon is a great place for people to heal. And I think it's amazing that they're going to open up a center for healing. Um, and so I just wanted to voice that, that I'm here because I support it happening. So thank you. Thank you, you Linda. Linda Fox. The audience. Uh, you, you're muted, Linda. I got it. I got it. 
So I support it as well. And I'm really excited about having um, Native Americans here on our island. And my question is, how long uh, before it happens? Is this going to be a couple of years or sooner before we see the Thunderbird place? Uh, from the Beachcomber article, Linda, it said 18 months to two years. Oh, did it? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank All right. You. Is that anything more? Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, thank you, Diane. Uh, uh, Captain uh, Drazik, I'm curious if you might comment on your perspective about the benefits of effective uh, drug and addiction treatment, uh, the um, the the portion of say um, of the of the work that you engage with right in in addressing community issues, the extent to which drug uh, addiction may be a, a driver of concerns that you need to address, and how important you see it from uh, your uh, Seattle King County uh, Sheriff's Office to make sure that you know we have effective programs to address uh, people who succumb to those uh, sort of uh, challenges of drug addiction? How important is it to you that, that this situation be addressed so that you can do your job more effectively? Curious what your thoughts are. Sure, thank you for that question, Kevin. Yeah, it's very important. Uh, and we, uh, our Sheriff's Office works in partnership with uh, many different organizations and with the, certainly with the community members uh, law enforcement is just one piece or one aspect of it. And these types of programs like we're talking about here are another piece uh, addressing a different angle. And when I mean, we all work together, um, you know, it's, I think of it a lot of times like different tools in a toolbox. If, if you only have a hammer, you know, they say everything looks like a nail, right? And so uh, if you have many different tools, you can use the appropriate tool for the situation or several tools together. So um, yes, drugs are obviously a big problem. Uh, in the community, literally minutes before I logged on to this uh, Zoom meeting, I was reviewing some emails and saw photos from uh, a invest recent investigation where some of our detective units work together and they just have stacks and stacks of, of drugs and kilos and bags of pills and thousands of dollars of cash um, that they've recently uh, acquired in an investigation making arrests and uh, there's just literally pounds and pounds of, of drugs that they're getting off the streets. And it's great, effective work. It's big investigations with a lot of time and manpower, but it shows us that that is out there. And as you well know, we certainly don't catch it all. So this is the part that we are catching. Um, and so that is one aspect of it uh, is the law enforcement piece. But obviously, if people who have uh, addictions and difficulties and struggles with these types of things can get assistance and help um, through facilities like this, through uh, the LEAD program in the King County, that's the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, uh, where we uh, have what we call drug court. And in, some, in many cases of people who get arrested for drugs, instead of going to jail, they get diverted to a drug program um, as an alternative to jail. You know, the old, in the old school way of thinking, it was like, hey, this person has drugs, it's against the law, put them in jail. And you know, we've progressed through that. And now we have programs uh, that we say, hey, how can we you know, really address the core issue? Um, yes, it's a crime. Um, and not everybody is, depending on what they've done, is, uh, is available to hit, hit a diversion program. But for those who are, uh, and that's uh, beyond the purview of our office, let's, let's do our best to get these folks the help they need so that we don't have recidivism. Great. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Appreciate the response there. Diane, I did post uh, something in the chat, which would be, I think, helpful to put in the meeting minutes. It's an interview cool. with the uh, CEO of the Seattle Indian Health Board on the Brown Briefly just this week. So that's in the chat. If you could make sure it's included in the minutes, I would appreciate it. Okay. Now we are running out of time. We're going to take these last three questions and then we're going to move on. So Eve. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Captain Drazich, for being here to discuss how the Sheriff's Department can support safety and human dignity on Vashon. And I have to say that I'm disappointed not in you, but that in general, that one of the first opportunities that the Community Council has to talk together about Thunderbird is in response to some 
uh, Islanders' fears that the treatment center may pose threats to residents of Vashon. As you said, that is an unfounded fear. And uh, many people might not know that the Thunderbird site in Rainier Beach had no incidents of criminal activity uh, by their residents, who they call relatives, in their entire time that they were there. Um, but since you're here to talk about safety, Captain, I want to note that nationally, people experiencing behavioral health, health issues are far more likely to be victims of crime than perpetrators. So I'm glad we're talking about safety. But since you're here, I want to ask what um, we can do as a community, but also what you can do as a sheriff's department to welcome and support and keep safe the residents and the, the relatives who will be served by the Thunderbird Center. Because as we know, uh, people who face behavioral health issues and also indigenous people are stigmatized and um, experience violence at the hands of, of other, others in our community, not necessarily our community, but in our society. And so I'm more concerned about the safety and the well-being and the sense of welcome and inclusion that the that people will feel when they come to the island to do the brave work of recovery. Sure. Yeah, those those you bring up very valid and important points, Eve, and, and thank you for that. And uh, yes, we share your concern. And uh, I want to be very clear that the objective of the sheriff's office and my direction to um, our deputies and sergeants is that as an organization, the sheriff's office is uh, is going to remain neutral on these uh, issues. We don't take sides. We don't have bias or favoritism. You know, our objective is to enforce the law impartially um, and fairly and justly. Uh, we are not, I am not directing and I'm not tolerating direction of, uh, of subordinates to emphasize this area or to avoid this area. It's just, we're gonna treat everybody the same and fairly. Um, and so for concerns on either side, for anyone's safety, my message would be uh, what, it, what it is on many other related issues, which is, please, by all means, uh, like my predecessor said, if you see something, say something. If you have any concerns at all um, for anybody, please call the sheriff's office. And a lot of folks I've found in my experience are hesitant to call 911 often they'll think, oh, you know, this isn't a huge thing, or I've got kind of a suspicion, I don't want to bother you, you know, it's not a, please do, um, because it's better to call us and not need us than to need us and not call us. So if, and we have call, the call receivers, anytime you call, uh, they have criteria by which they dispatch deputies. And so if you call and it's something that doesn't meet the criteria, they'll just, you're not wasting anybody's time. Um, they won't dispatch them because it doesn't meet the criteria. And if it does, then they're happy to send us and our, our deputies will go. Okay, yes, we have, uh, you wanna come on up? Hi, I'm Lisa Devereaux. So I came to the meeting tonight mostly for this topic. Um, I guess my biggest concern is what I have heard, not only in our lovely social media, but in the beachcomber and in meetings is that people are surprised we have Native American people on Basha. So I challenge you to take the next 18 to 24 months to meet the people in your own community. My household is Native American. My children are Native American. We have many friends who live here who are Native American. And I'm surprised when people say, why do we need a, a Native American treatment facility on an island with no Indians? Wow, that is a sad, sad thing about our island there. Um, so let's make it a point. We've got time. Let's reach out and meet our neighbors and, um, and welcome a new group. I made a, a stop at the center at VCC and uh, met the new director and she's lovely and her staff is lovely and I would encourage you all to do the same. They're also wondering if they're gonna be welcomed here. So let's make them feel welcome. Let's re remember that the Indians were here before us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jean. I, I also wanna say, I just think this is uh, such a wonderful opportunity for us to welcome people who are facing challenges and to um, be open and welcoming as a community. 
So, you know, I really hope we can do that. And I also want to give a shout out to the interview on the Brown briefly. It's really, really good. And yeah, thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Jean. David. David disappeared. Looks okay. like you're this, muted. Oh, there this, we go. Yeah, yeah. This this really feel, fills a void in this community and in the county. I've treat I've um, worked with people with substance abuse issues for 25 years, and it is such a horrendous problem to deal with for people, for families, and it's not as if this will increase crime in the area, but it will provide opportunities for people who really need it. I had a client recently who lost her life. She was an Islander and, and if she had the ability to go to a facility like this, she'd probably still be with us. So, um, you know, I, I just think it's great. I know that originally the community care center was built kind of in reaction to a proposal to make a halfway house there. Um, and that may have had some safety concerns, but this is nothing like that. And, and all I can say is it's a great thing for the community and, and for the native community. Thank you. Thank you all very much for everything. Uh, and Captain Drezich, thank you very much for uh, helping to allay people's fears because uh, there were quite a few people who were concerned. Well, thank you very so much. Before I jump off, I'd just like to say thank you for including me, including us uh, in this discussion. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and I would encourage all of you, uh, please call the Sheriff's Office anytime. 24-7, uh, we are here. There are always two cops on the island. Um, and we would love to work in partnership with you and be responsive, you know, to your concerns and needs. And, uh, you know, if you don't tell us, we don't know. So please keep the lines of communication open. Um, and if you've got any concerns or bad experiences, we want to know that too. And we have systems in place to address those. Uh, but we're hoping for great things going forward. Thank you. And I would just like to say that uh, at our May meeting, we have invited the Seattle Indian Health Board to attend. Uh, haven't heard any, anything back from them yet, but we're hoping to have a longer discussion then and additional discussions as we go forward. So this is, we just, it was too early to have them come, but we wanted to at least address people's concerns who were sending emails and, and having uh, concerns. We didn't want to wait until, until May. All right. We'll All see right, you again. On. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Next, we have bye bye. <laughs> Next, we have our committee and board updates. And uh, I would like to just go ahead and start with uh, Justin Hirsch and the Ferry Advisory Committee. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, I have uh, just a few things to announce. Um, WSF had earlier reported to us that uh, they would conduct a trial of service restoration. Uh, for three weeks in April, um, uh, there was a week uh, right at the beginning of the month in which we had uh, evening service cancellations three out of seven nights um, due to lack of crew. Um, obviously, that situation is very frustrating. Um, after that, I inquired uh, with WSF quite a number of times as to what their intentions were. Um, they then responded to me that uh, service restoration has been postponed until May, but no specific date in May. Um, then, I think everybody's aware at this point that the ferry Walla Walla ran aground uh, last weekend um, on Bainbridge Island. Uh, the South, one of our um, two boats, the smaller one, was diverted from Vashon briefly to help uh, address that crisis situation. I have not heard um, of a revised plan from WSF after the cell, after the Walla Walla grounding. Um, but clearly having an additional boat out of service does not at all um, weigh in favor of service restoration on Vashon or in the Triangle Route in general. Um, so obviously all of that's very frustrating. <clears throat> um, 
they say we're on a two boat set schedule. I say we're on a 1.6 boat schedule because the South only carries 80 cars as opposed to our normal 120. Um, all, I know all of my fellow commuters are definitely feeling the pain there. Um, last announcement for the Ferry Advisory Committee is that uh, our bi-monthly public meeting is coming up next Wednesday, April 26th at the Vashon Library at 7 p.m. Um, it will also be a hybrid meeting via Zoom. And I'm gonna put the Zoom link in the chat right now. Um, so uh, please feel free to attend the Ferry Advisory Committee meeting. We do expect at least one, if not two WSF officials to be present there, and I intend to ask some rather pointed questions uh, to get a detailed response from them as to exactly where we are. Um, meeting will start promptly at seven and it has to end uh, just a moment before eight o'clock because the library does close at eight. I don't wanna make uh, anyone have to stay later at the end of their workday. And that's what I have to report. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Justin. Now we next have the post office committee. I'm not sure if Jim Garrison is with us this evening. May, excuse me. I'm I'm sorry. I don't know how to do the raise your hand little thingy, Diane. It's okay. Go ahead. And Kari. And um, I can only emphasize that the last FAC meeting I went to, I was the only bash on attendee period, except for the FAC members. Now, fairies are our lifeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've probably heard this from me before, uh, starting way back in the, well, after Tim Iman and 1996. But please, you guys, you need to write your legislators. You need to tell them what you want and need from WSF. It's not WSF's fault. They have a budget. It's set by the legislature. And if we don't complain, if we don't ask, our legislators are only going to guess how this is, how much this is important to us. So please start taking a little bit more notice of how these ferries affect you, your businesses, your social life, the prices of your goods, and if you can't come to the meetings, at least educate yourself. And thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, on the post office committee, Jim, are you on, on the call? Yes, I am. Hi, Diane. Oh, very good. What, what would you like to share with us this evening? Well, we had a meeting uh, earlier in the week or was it last week? I lose track of time, but um, I wonder if, if Erica, is Erica in the meeting tonight? Did she? I'm not seeing her. Okay, well, I'm sure you all read the Beachcomber a week ago, which detailed a story about an Amazon employee who questioned, <coughs> excuse me, the number of packages who were that were coming to Vashon and apparently Amazon has some in-house rules about how many packages are delivered to a rural post office. And Vashon was exceeding that quite dramatically, almost by 2,000 packages a day. And when she requested that the packages be reduced and sent by other shippers, uh, Amazon agreed. And the load to the Vashon post office has been dramatically reduced. And I don't go to the post office very often, but it seems quite a bit better since that action was taken by uh, Erica and Amazon. So all of us owe a big uh, debt of gratitude to Erica. And 
if anybody has comments from the audience about their experience at the post office, I'd like to hear it and we can discuss it at the next meeting. But again, if you see Erica around, give her a pat on the back and say thanks because she probably had more to do with reducing the lines at the post office than anything we've done as a committee. So uh, that's all I got, Diane. Yes, Kim has something she'd like to say about that. Jen, when is the next meeting? The Sorry, next meeting, she's just asking when the next meeting of the post office committee is. I have uh, it in my calendar. It's uh, Tuesday, May 9th at seven o'clock. It's online. Okay. It'll be a Zoom meeting. It'll be uh, a Zoom Linda. Meeting. Hi, I just want to say really quickly that I've noticed that, that the energy of the the workers at the post office lately has been so lovely. I mean, they are not, they don't seem stressed out. Um, and that is really good to see. So if that had something to do with it, I'm really grateful for, for what she did. Thanks. Yes, I'm sure it does. Okay, yes, if she comes to a meeting, we will have an opportunity to all thank her. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Equity, Social Justice and Inclusion Committee. Kevin, Kevin yes, Jones. Thank you. thank you, Diana. I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, your participation as a uh, standing member of the committee. Jessica, Mila, Linda, Eve, Terry, Yvonne, and James are all here with us tonight. So appreciate your participation. Um, I'd like to say that the committee's outreach initiative continues. We're interviewing community leaders and individuals <clears throat> to have those meaningful discussions around equity, social justice, and inclusion. Our plan, of course, is to broaden our awareness so that we can understand how the community council can be as effective as possible to address some of the barriers that members of our community face. Uh, as we learn, we hopefully will understand uh, how uh, we're more able to um, address some of the concerns that we discover. Um, also, uh, it was requested that the committee discuss and have input on the Equal Rights Amendment, which will be presented later in this meeting. Uh, basically, that discussion was, uh, let's move forward. It's a good time to bring this motion forward. Uh, no re recommended changes, so we'll go ahead and uh, present that uh, as we discussed earlier. Uh, you'll hear that later in the meeting. Um, just want to say also for the record regarding the earlier discussion about the Homeland Security operation, uh, my hope is that local law enforcement will have been able to hear uh, our discussion and how important it is for us that they have a voice when it comes to talking with those other uh, law enforcement uh, entities in our country, uh, that we expect them to stand up for our, our values and uh, that while, you know, obviously law enforcement is a deterrent, we all understand that, but while uh, we here are trying to build bridges, sometimes um, yeah. this large type of response can destroy trust. So hopefully um, that message has been uh, understood and delivered. So thank yeah. you for the time to convey any of that. Nope. Any questions nope. I'm here, happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna move on. We're running really quite late. Uh, Town plan committee update, David Vogel. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, David. We muted you. All right. Uh, the town plan committee is in the process of um, being formed, and we've sent out um, a survey monkey to get people to apply for the town plan committee. And I would encourage anyone who's interested in the issue of affordable housing, particularly in the town plan at in the town area itself, which is most conducive on Vashon Island for affordable housing, please try to get involved. We have a good group so far of applicants and we will be um, probably forming the committee in early May and, and meeting in May. So um, I believe the applications are due May 1st. Uh, if anyone needs an application, uh, please reach out to myself or to Diane. Uh, we can get an application to you. Is it on, available on the website, Diane? The survey? I'm monk? not sure. I okay. think it is. I think it is under, under committees. Okay, good. Um, and so 
it's something that I think will make a big difference uh, to the island. And it's just focusing on pretty, um, pretty discrete issues in the 2024 King County Comprehensive Plan update. Um, a special district overlay and P suffix conditions that can have an impact on affordable housing for the island. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. A question? Quick addition, um, we have 14 applicants. We have 14 applicants for this, uh, for this very, very important committee. Thanks, and uh, the deadline is May 1st, if you're interested. Okay, now there's a new transportation committee that's being formed. Jake Jakobovich, would you wanna come on up? Sure, start, David. Will your committee also address the 2024 King County uh, COP plan revisions and stuff like that also? You know, I think, uh, I think that would be um, too much to put on our plates at this point. Great. The reason I ask is that maybe we should consider uh, find, figuring out a body to do that body of work also. Mm -hmm. we got time. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Jake Jakobovich, and uh, I have suggested to the community council that we create a transportation subcommittee. And uh, the I believe that the board uh, agreed with that. I'm here tonight to gain validity for that. And uh, the, the, I wrote a mission statement, which is draft and the committee will modify it if needed. But uh, mobility is a human right. We're committed to working with our community members, community partners, government agencies and non-governmental organizations to ensure all voices are heard and considered building partnerships where interactive open di dialogue and communication is the norm will enable quicker and better solutions to address the concerns of the community. And so that transportation <clears throat> on the island involves a dial-a-ride transit program, uh, the local services being the roads division with right-of-way concerns, pedestrian concerns, bicyclist concerns, equestrian concerns, automotive and trucking, and regarding roads and shoulders, vegetation, site distance, road ends and vacations, capital improvements on grants and things of that nature. Uh, Metro Transit for bus service, Metro Transit for the water taxi, and Metro Transit for the rideshare van pool program. And for WashDOT, uh, most people don't realize it, but there's a lot of money that can come from WashDOT to support programs on the island, like Safe Routes to School. I got grants on um, that for the school district. Uh, paratransit for the mobility of seniors and individuals with disabilities. There's community development block grants. And, uh, you know, uh, some of our non governmental partners would be the Senior Center, the Chamber of Commerce, the Post Office, and things like that. So I would just real quickly say that uh, I, uh, I will be the interim uh, chair until the group is formed and they can make their own chair whether it's me or someone else, that's all right. I've worked 37 years in King County Department of Transportation and uh, in the road division, in environmental division. Uh, I put in that big pipe on Southwest 216th that's uh, 16 feet in diameter that passes Judd Creek through. They said it couldn't be done because you couldn't get a crane over here. That was big enough, the ferries couldn't take it. Well, I went and found structural plate pipe that you can bolt up. So uh, uh, innovative. I've worked in the shipyards. I've worked for Metro Transit. Uh, I was a merchant marine. I've worked on passenger ferries in San Francisco. And uh, I know professionally John Taylor from Local Services, Michelle Allison, uh, Director of Metro Transit, Roger Millar, the Washington State uh, Secretary of Transportation, and Chad Wiesenfield for the uh, manager of the uh, King County Water Taxi. So. Uh, I got the connections to get us all rolling and uh, hope to get your approval tonight from the body. Thank you very much, Jake. Yes, we have certainly got the right guy for this committee and uh, the board has approved it. So there's no need for, for okay. the, the rest of the community. That contact to information it. should be on the website. Uh, 
right? Or will be real soon. Yes, that's right. My and we don't have time for questions. I'm sorry, Kevin. And my first meeting will be in May. I have not scheduled that yet, but. Um, okay, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Strawberry Festival update, John Affelter. Uh, for, in order for them to hear you, you're gonna have to come over here. <laughs> Well, we were, uh, as you, as the uh, announcement was made, we got a thousand dollars from the painter grant. Uh, we're now in the process. I just sent out all of the uh, possible uh, pieces of equipment that we can purchase. And so we've got to decide which ones we want to buy and get started on that. Um, I'm working with Mika um, about the placement of the booth and um, uh, also arranging for, uh, in our board meeting, uh, a contract with her to provide a uh, strawberry shortcake service that we can use to raise some funds. Uh, and I think that's about it. Thank right you now. very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the work. Okay. So I have a board update. I want to announce that Jessica Anikar is now our corresponding secretary. And that we're all so very grateful that you've taken on this role, Jessica. And you're already seeing, especially this month, way more uh, correspondence than we normally have. Feel free to get my email on the website and send me your questions. I love hearing them. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so those are our updates and we're moving very fast. I'm sorry that we have been able had to shorten these things, but we're squished for time tonight. And now we uh, have a new business motion to support the Equal Rights Amendment from Kevin Jones. Thank you, Diane. I put this in the chat. I'll go ahead and read it into the minutes. Gender equity is important to Vashon Mori Islanders. The Vashon Mori Community Council requests our elected U.S. Senators, Senator Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell, go on record and publicly declare their support of Senate Joint Resolution 4. We request our elected U.S. Representative, Pramila Jayapal, go on record and publicly declare her support of House Joint Resolution 25. And we request our elected members of Congress vote yes, should these joint resolutions be scheduled for a vote. I will need a second. Second. Deborah Gusson seconded. And we so will not vote. Will... Correct. Yes, uh, this will be a subject for vote at the next meeting. I'd like to provide just a very small background. The Equal Rights Amendment was introduced in 1923, it calls for gender equality. All of the requisite states have now uh, basically ratified the amendment. However, Congress put a deadline for states to do so. That deadline is passed. Congress can remove that deadline, and that's what these joint resolutions do. So uh, calling upon our uh, members of Congress to take that action, support those resolutions, will help pave the way to make this Equal Rights Amendment the 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Appreciate your time. We'll talk more next month. Right, so uh, this motion will be, we have a month to discuss and think about things like this and we'll be voting on it at our next meeting and the whole full wording of the uh, uh, motion will be in the, in the announcement for the next meeting for everybody. Okay, thank you. So now we are going to no old business and we have community updates and uh, John, it's back to you for the propane gas update. Do you have anything to share or no news? No news. Okay. Krista came back and put communication with her and she hasn't. Uh, they can't hear you. So if you're going to give an update, give an update. If not, no. okay. No. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, and the Thunderbird Treatment Center, we pretty much covered that, don't you think, John, as far as where we're at with that? Okay. Now then, Vashon Household Volunteer Day. Who do we have from Vashon Household here this evening? Hi, y'all. It's Christy. I just, I, uh, Diane, I put my update into chat actually to save some time. But yes, we'd love to have you guys on April 29th. Uh, the sign up is in the chat. Please spread the word. All right. Very good. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, we're doing whatever we can do to help Vashon household. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then Stephen Bailey, are you here? I am, yes, thank you. Thanks, Diane, uh, getting in under the wire here. Hi, everybody, my name's Stephen Bailey. I'm part of the management team for the Vashon Library. And I uh, wanted to share some news for you. Um, after uh, COVID hit, of course, the library shut down um, and um, 
we've been slowly adding back hours uh, ever since as we add back staff as well. Our next um, expansion of hours comes next month on May 15th. We're going to uh, be open on Mondays now, in addition to our Tuesday through Saturday schedule. Uh, the hours will be uh, Monday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, so we have been closing at 5. We're going to extend that by an hour to uh, allow more folks to come after work. Tuesdays and Wednesdays will be open from noon until 8 p.m. Thursdays and Fridays, also 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And Saturday hours will now be 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. We look forward to seeing you at the Vashon Library. Thanks for the time. Wow, how about thank you, Stephen? That's all wonderful news. I'm glad you were able. To, I'm glad we were able to fit you in. Thank you. And look at this. We're ending on time. Isn't this amazing? amazing. Our next meeting is Thursday, May 18th, seven o'clock on Zoom and here at the Land Trust. And we'll uh, see you all then. We're adjourning at nine o'clock.